let's get started. So first of all, let's start by estimating the cost of debt capital here. And if I can go ahead and do that, there we go. So I want to emphasize we're looking at debt capital now. So we want to do this for all of these different cases. And here's how you do it for debt is you want to go out and find in the industry comparable firms. Our firm right now has no leverage. You want to go out and find comparables that have debt to enterprise value ratios around 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. 90%. This is the type of thing that folks at investment banks do as a service for their customers all the time. So if you're interested in this, this is something you might find yourself doing at an investment bank. Once we've got those comparable firms with these leverage ratios, we compute their pre-tax cost of debt capitals. How do we do that? We just go right from their balance sheets and income statements where the if we're just using financial statements for the whole firm weighted average, the pre-tax cost of debt capital is equal to interest expense divided by debt at beginning of the period. So that's the prior year's balance sheet. And we're assuming, since these are comps, we went out and did this for comps, okay? They're in the same industry. They have some more customers, some more products, stuff like that. The only difference is they've chosen to capitalize themselves in a different way. So since they're comps, we assume that if SCI were levered the same way, its cost of debt capital would be the same. So this is a comps-based, marketplace-based analysis to find this data, okay? And so something like this might, well, once you're familiar with this, it might take you a day. It might take you three or four days the first time. But once you've, once you've done some of these, it, it might take you a day. Also depends on the company, how many comps it has. Uh, if it's not a publicly traded company, this won't work at all, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm assuming right now it works. It has comps, it's publicly traded, et cetera. And all the comps are publicly traded, et cetera. So we go out and we spend our day or two or three on this, okay? And and we find for a firm like SCI, if it has no debt right now and it was just going to take out a little itty bitty bitty loan, it would be expected to pay about 6.75% on that loan. If it wanted to lever itself up to 20% debt to enterprise value, it would be riskier. And so it would have a weighted average uh, pre-tax cost of debt capital of 7.25%. If it levered itself up more to 40%, that cost of capital, debt capital is going to go up again. Why? Again, because things are looking good with leverage, but it also, as we know, increases bankruptcy risk in bad times. So we do this all the way up to some comparable firms, and you want to find more than one comp, right? So we find two or three comps here that are very levered 90 percent and on average their cost of debt capital is 16 percent so we have a pretty big range here right more than a doubling of the cost of capital from essentially no debt to very highly levered and key point behind this, of course, as I've said, is that um, similar firms are going to pay increasing interest rates as their leverage increases. So this works for the comps. We would assume because they're comps, it would be true for FCI. So this is good. So we have one big, big piece of data. Now we got to do the same thing with the equity cost of capital. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. So we need to estimate the equity cost of capital for all these levels of debt to enterprise value. And this is one reason, frankly, that CAPM is a very popular model, even though, as we know, it's got a lot of problems and oftentimes doesn't work very well. It's really easy to do this, find all this data, the equity cost of capital for 0% leverage, 20%, 40%, 60%. It's really easy to estimate that using CAPM and Hamada's equation. Um, and that's not an excuse, excuse, but it's a fact on the ground. Okay, so here's our CAPM model again, which everybody's familiar with. We've computed equity cost of capital with this a couple of times. Um, and 
we know what all these things are. This is the cost of equity capital estimate for this firm. It's equal to the risk-free rate, which we'd measure probably by treasuries. And then plus that increment for market risk, which is the market return rate minus the risk-free rate times beta J. And beta comes from that regression of the company we're considering versus the market, right? So beta comes out of that regression. Okay, we've been through that before, so let's move on to that. And then we're going to use this Hamada's equation, which I did bring up uh, with us briefly in the previous chapter. And I did promise you, I promised you that you would not have to compute things with Hamada's equation. That's still true, but it, it's central to what's going on here. So I want to show it to you and show you how it works here. So Hamada's equation comes into things like this. We're, we're going to use for each of these levels of leverage, we're going to use the CAPM equation to estimate the equity cost of capital. And we're going to use Hamada's equation to keep estimating beta for 0% leverage, 20% leverage, 40% leverage, 60% leverage. You can see here in this equation, nothing else has anything to do with the leverage of the firm we're considering. The risk-free rate in treasuries doesn't care. The total market rate doesn't care. And again, the risk-free treasury rate doesn't care. So we have to account for the leverage increasing this equity cost of capital through beta. And that's what Hamada's equation does. So Hamada's equation says that a levered beta for a company is equal to the beta that we find for that company with no leverage. That's what BU stands for here. Beta of similar firms or the firm we're looking at with no leverage. And beta L is beta of similar firms, comparable firms, same firm we're looking at with leverage. So the leveraged beta is equal to the beta with the firm when it has no debt, okay, times this whole mess, okay. And the key thing you have to see with this whole mess is that as this term gets bigger, the beta is going to get bigger, right? Actually, this, this whole term, as this whole thing gets bigger, the beta is going to get bigger. So someone happily has gone out and done an SCI to market regression for us and found that the beta for SCI in its unlevered state is 1.1. Okay, so then we can just use now Hamada's equation. There's nothing in here that we don't know. We'll put in we'll put in 20% for this ratio, 40%, 60%, and we know the tax rate is 40%. So we'll be able to estimate beta leverage for each of these. So let's see, let's see how it works here. If we have 0% leverage, the unlevered beta is the levered beta. If we have 20% leverage, the beta of the firm, because it's riskier now, has increased to 1.27. And again, that's going to directly increase the cost of equity capital through the CAPM equation. And if we have 40% leverage, the beta goes up even more. 60% leverage, it goes up even more, 80%, 90%. And it's going up mathematically. Again, you don't have to compute this, but it's going up mathematically through that equation. Okay. And here again is that equation. So now that we've got our beta in each of these cases, we can compute our cost of equity capital for each level of leverage, okay? So for with the unlevered beta of 1.1 cost of equity capital, 11.5% from the CAPM model and 20% leverage because this is increasing, we get a higher equity cost of capital, 12.3%. 40% it gets even higher, 60% higher, 80% higher, and 90% wildly higher, okay? So unlike our range of debt cost of capital, which increased by about 100%, we've got this increasing by about 400%, okay? So very, very big difference. And that sort of makes sense because in bankruptcy, owners get nothing, right? And in bankruptcy, the bondholders or the lenders have a claim on the company, but shareholders usually get nothing. And so, like I've said here, the cost of equity capital, capital is increasing with increasing leverage, just like our uh, cost of debt capital, but, but more pronounced. 
Okay, so now I think we're ready to, we, I think we have everything we need now to compute our weighted average cost of capital for each of these levels of leverage. And then we know the minimum weighted average cost of capital is going to correspond to the optimum leverage level. And how do we compute that weighted average cost of capital? With our standard unchanging weighted average cost of capital equation that the weighted average cost of capital is one minus the tax rate or 40 percent times our uh, cost of debt capital at this leverage ratio times the weight of debt with that leverage ratio plus our equity cost of capital at this leverage ratio times our weight of equity on the next page i've got uh, all of these cases worked out for us so i've got i'm calling no debt case one and 20% D over D plus E case two, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see how it works here. So the first thing we want to have is we want to have a nice table like this that shows everything that's going on to the CFO on one page. So the first thing that we show her is we went out and did this work on comps of different leverage. And we found that, for example, for comps with a 60% debt to enterprise value, that the cost of debt capital is about almost 11%. And for our very highly levered comps, we found that the their cost of debt capital was about 16% on average. And then we had to go through and do the similar thing with the equity cost of capital. So first, we went out in the marketplace and just looked up comps to get our debt cost of capital. And then for our equity cost of capital, we used our CAPM model with Hamada's equation. Um, and we saw on the previous page how that worked out. So we found for comp firms that are levered to about 40% debt to enterprise value cost of equity capital, about 13.7%. Also, while we're here, always good, always, always good to check our work. The cost of equity capital should always be higher than the cost of debt capital. And that's because the debt holders have their contract, right? So even if the company flames out, they're gonna get something. And the shareholders, if the company goes bankrupt, almost always shareholders get nothing. So they have higher risk, so they should be demanding a higher discount rate. And we're seeing that in the numbers. 13.7% is greater than 9%, 16.45% is greater than 10.85%, et cetera. So that's just another way you can check your work, make sure you're doing something reasonable. So now I think we have every piece we need to compute our opportunity cost of capital for each of these cases, one through six. And that's exactly what I've done down here. Okay, so here's my WD, 20%, 40%, 60%, etc. Okay, and one minus the tax rate. Tax rate is 40%. That's always 60%. And then I go through and I just plug everything into our weighted average cost of capital equation here, and I find our weighted average cost of capital, if there is no debt at all, it's equal to our equity cost of capital. That makes sense because we have no debt, okay? And if we lever the firm up to 20% debt to enterprise value, the weighted average cost of capital comes down, interestingly enough, and that's because of the tax yield effect and things like that, to 10.73%. That's This is coming down because we have this nice tax shield effect there. And then for case three, it's down even more, 10.4%. And now with case four, it's starting to go up again, 10.5%. And here, if we lever up a lot, 11.2% and 12.8% if we're very highly levered up here at 90%. Okay, so what do we know? We know that the present value of the future cash flows for this firm is going to be maximized when the opportunity cost of capital is minimized. So that is definitely case three, right? So case three is our winner, okay? So we choose case three with our debt to enterprise value of 40%. It's really that simple. I mean, you can see there's a lot of work behind this, right? You've got to go out and get all this data for RD in the marketplace. And then you have to trust your 
firstborns, firstborns, firstborn to the CAPM model down here, which we all know is probably not such a great idea, um, but it's better than nothing and it's what we got. So let's do our computation for this case, case three, just to make sure that we can all do this. So we're just gonna uh, plug in our weighted average cost of capital equation with everything we know. So one minus the tax rate is 60% because the tax rate was 40%, okay, times RD. I've got to look that up. I don't remember. Of course, I don't remember. So that's that's 9%, okay, so that's 9%. Um, and the weight of debt there was uh, 40%. And then plus, I have to look up the equity cost of capital here, which is 13.7%, and if the weight of debt is 40%, the weight of the equity better be 60%, okay? And let's just uh, take this over to Excel to make sure that I don't have any uh, typos in there, okay? And we get 10.38%, and I believe that's correct, which we should be able to verify, yep, 10.83%. So you can see how by hand all of these guys are calculated. So that's it. We're done. It's it's honestly that simple. We just go back now and report to the CFO the optimum leverage ratio equals 40% by debt to enterprise value ratio here. And we would also want to report back to her the corresponding RE of 13.7%, the RD of 9%, and the weighted average cost of capital of 10.38%.